Okay, so picture this. You're sealed inside this uh, tiny metal sphere, thousands and thousands of feet above the Earth. Higher than any human had ever been before. Exactly. The air outside, practically nothing, a vacuum. It's freezing cold. Intense cold. And then bang, there's this crash inside with you, a vital instrument, the barometer, it's just shattered. And it spills mercury. Yeah. Deadly, corrosive mercury. Right. All over the floor of your cabin. And this cabin floor, the whole sphere basically, is made of aluminum. Which mercury just dissolves, eats through it like acid. So you're perched there, literally at the edge of space, and this this immediate life-threatening danger is spreading like a liquid right at your feet. That whole terrifying scene, it wasn't some sci-fi story, it actually happened. Yeah, it was a very, very real moment for a scientist named Auguste Picard. During the first successful flight into the stratosphere, no less. And believe it or not, that's really just the start of this deep dive we're doing today. Mm. We're jumping into the sources you brought about Auguste Picard, this, this guy who had this incredibly audacious idea to push human exploration well, in two completely opposite directions. Raced first up to the very edge of the sky, like we just heard. And then later in his life, down, way down into the deepest parts of the ocean. So our mission, really, for this deep dive is yeah. to unpack all that. The incredible inventions, sure, but also the sheer resilience. And the surprising insights, you yeah. know, that come from the life of a man who just refused to accept limits. That's what the sources show. We're going to pull out those key moments, those nuggets that really show not just what he did, but maybe why his story still resonates, why it's relevant. Refuse to accept limits. I mean, yeah. that almost feels like an understatement, doesn't it? It really does. The nerve it must have taken to just step into that pressurized metal ball dangling from a balloon. And just head upwards into the complete unknown. It's, uh, it's genuinely astonishing when you think about it. And what jumps out from the sources right away is that his story isn't just about, you know, setting records. It's really about how he navigated adversity. Right. Whether he was way up high above the planet or deep down below the waves, the challenges he faced weren't just roadblocks. They were catalysts, weren't they? Exactly. Catalysts for ingenuity. And that innovation, fascinatingly, often popped up in places you would least expect. Okay, so where does this journey begin, this uh, sky and sea pioneer? The sources take us back to Basel, Switzerland, right? That's right. Picard grew up there. And the sources emphasize his family environment. Curiosity wasn't just, you know, tolerated. It was actively encouraged, valued. That kind of background feels important. Oh, it's crucial. It clearly fostered this lifelong drive in him to ask big questions, to look for answers beyond what was already known. And wasn't his brother also an explorer? Yeah. Interestingly, he had a twin brother, Gene. And Gene also became an explorer, pushing similar boundaries with high-altitude balloons. Seems like adventure definitely ran in that family. But a guest, he had this specific scientific itch he needed to scratch way up high. Cosmic rays. Ah, yes, cosmic rays. He was completely fascinated by them, these mysterious high-energy particles just constantly bombarding the Earth. And he got it into his head that the only way to really study them properly was to get above the thickest part of the atmosphere higher than anyone had ever managed before. Which, of course, meant inventing something completely new to survive up there. Precisely. His solution was this sealed, pressurized sphere. You can think of it like a tiny artificial environment. Designed to keep the air pressure breathable inside. Even as the balloon carried them up into the near vacuum conditions of the stratosphere. Okay, and this is where we hit one of those really surprising details from the sources you mentioned. Yeah. You'd think, okay, cutting edge 1930s tech, pressurized capsule for record-breaking flight. It must have been built by some specialized aviation or engineering firm, right? That's the logical assumption, absolutely. Yeah. But the sources reveal this pioneering capsule was actually built by, well, by a Belgian brewery. A brewery. I love that detail. Isn't that something? It just completely flits the script on where innovation has to come from. Yeah. It turns out the practical skills they needed you know, expertise in working with metals, welding tanks that could hold pressure, yeah. ensuring tight seals. Skills needed for making beer vats. Exactly. Those skills were readily available right there. It's just a great reminder that sometimes the answers to really wild, ambitious problems come from totally unexpected places mm -hmm. just by using existing practical know-how. It's fantastic. So, okay, they've got this Brewery built sphere, a huge hydrogen balloon. The date is set, May 27, 1931. Picard and his assistant, Paul Kipfer, they climb into the gondola. 
The balloon lifts off. The ground starts falling away. You see the earth receding below. The air gets thinner and thinner. The temperature just plummets. And then that moment we started with, disaster. The barometer shatters. Mercury spills everywhere. And the sources describe it so chillingly, this highly toxic, corrosive liquid just sloshing around, attacking their aluminum shell at 50,000 feet. It wasn't like a slow leak or some minor glitch. This was immediate, potentially catastrophic, eating through their only protection from the void outside. You'd absolutely expect sheer panic in that situation. Blind terror, maybe? Anyone would. Yeah. But what's really remarkable, and a key insight the sources give us about Picard himself, is how he reacted. No panic. Apparently not. Instead of freezing up, he immediately went into problem-solving mode. That's what the account suggests. Which is just incredible under that kind of pressure. It really is. This shows it wasn't just about abstract ambition for him. It was this deep well of practical ingenuity, improvisation, when things went sideways. Yeah. I mean, they didn't exactly have a manual for what to do when toxic mercury is dissolving your spacecraft to the edge of space. Right. So what do they do? The sources say they grab whatever they could find, literally scraps of cloth, some Vaseline they had. Vaseline. Seriously. Seriously. Desperately trying to contain the spill, soak it up, and patch the tiny holes that were already starting to appear in the aluminum. And that moment right there, that's the lesson, isn't it? True ingenuity, real problem solving, often emerges not in some clean lab setting, but right in the thick of it. When you're facing immediate life-threatening necessity. Exactly. Forcing you to just make do with whatever you happen to have on hand. And the mercury spill, astonishingly, wasn't the only thing trying to kill them up there. No. The sources detail this whole cascade of other crises hitting them one after another. Like the balloon's release valve freezing shut? Yes. Which trapped them. They literally became, as one source put it, prisoners of the atmosphere. Unable to come down when they wanted to. Just drifting, helplessly stuck at an altitude no one had ever survived for any length of time. And then the motor that was supposed to rotate the gondola failed. Right, which caused the temperature inside the sphere to just skyrocket. So on top of being trapped, dealing with mercury fumes, now they're also cooking in there. Pretty much. Facing sweltering heat inside their little metal ball. And didn't their drinking water evaporate too? Yep. Another critical problem piled onto everything else. The sources paint this incredibly vivid picture. It wasn't a smooth flight. Not at all. It was a relentless 17-hour ordeal, a constant test of their wits, their resourcefulness, their sheer will just to stay alive. Yet somehow, through all that chaos, all those near disasters, mm. they did achieve something absolutely monumental. They did. They spent 17 hours floating higher than any human beings ever had before. And the payoff for all that terror and ingenuity. The view. They were the first people to look down and clearly see the distinct curvature of the Earth with their own eyes. Just imagine that. Seeing the thin blue line of the atmosphere below you, the blackness of space above. And the actual curve of the planet stretching out. A view earned through sheer grit and survival. Yeah. It must have been a moment of just unparalleled discovery right in the midst of extreme peril. Getting back down wasn't exactly a walk in the park either, though. No, their eventual landing was anything but gentle. It was basically a crash landing onto a glacier high up in the Austrian Alps. And people on the ground had given them up for dead, hadn't they? They had. Rescue teams had pretty much written them off. So you can imagine the shock, the sheer relief and astonishment when Picard and Kipfer finally emerged alive, shaken, but alive from those remote mountains. You know, this whole first phase of his life, reaching such incredible heights, breaking records, but then surviving that incredibly perilous fall, it really brings us to a core question the sources raise. We should. What's the real measure of a person? Is it how high they climb, the peaks they reach, the records they set? Or is it maybe how they handle the descent, how they cope when everything goes wrong? Yeah. The way they improvise and just keep going. It's a powerful way to frame it, and honestly, for most people, just surviving that flight would be the defining story of their entire life. Absolutely. The end of the adventure. But for Picard, his story doesn't end there at all. That same insatiable curiosity that drove him upwards... It just pivoted. He turned his gaze in the completely opposite direction. Downwards. Into the abyss. It's exactly. From conquering the edge of space... He set his sights on exploring the deepest trenches of the ocean. Which led to his next major invention, the bath escape. Right. And think about the shift in challenges. The stratospheric balloon had to deal with near vacuum, minimal pressure, extreme cold. While the bath escape had to withstand the opposite, 
unimaginable crushing water pressure. And total darkness miles below the surface. Mm. A completely different, arguably even tougher, engineering problem to solve. And the sources make it really clear that adversity was still his constant companion, just, you know, in a different element this time. Liquid instead of air. Oh, development was far from smooth. <laughs> the sources detail constant setbacks. Like what? Well, there were storms that battered the prototype vessels during testing. The sheer fury of the sea literally destroyed buoyancy floats that were designed to withstand immense pressure. Wow. And then, of course, World War II intervened. That brought years of delays, halting progress completely for a long time. So the whole process was just fraught with failure. Very much so. The sources actually use that phrase, failure was a constant companion during the bathyscape development period. This was absolutely not a straight shot to success. Yet, despite all those setbacks, all those delays, the destruction of his prototypes, Picard just refused to give up on the vision. He just kept going, kept rebuilding, kept rethinking the design, kept incorporating the hard lessons learned from each failure. And he brought his son into it. Right. Jacques. Yes. And that collaboration became absolutely crucial. Jacques Picard would carry the Bathyscape project forward after his father, eventually making those legendary dives to the deepest parts of the ocean. And ultimately, after all those years of struggle, all that perseverance, the Bathyscape was a success. It was a huge success. Yeah. And the sources frame it really nicely, I think, not just as an engineering marvel, which the final version, the Trieste, certainly became. Reaching the very bottom of the Mariana Trench. Exactly. But the sources frame that success as something more. A direct victory born from that relentless perseverance, that refusal to give in to despair. It's a really powerful through line, isn't it? Connecting his sky adventures and his deep sea adventures. It really is. Yeah. That willingness to face failure, repeated failure, and just keep pushing forward anyway. Now, like a lot of people who push boundaries really hard, Picard wasn't without his critics or controversies. The sources do touch on this. They do. They mentioned that some observers back then questioned his methods. They worried about the immense risks he took. Not just with his own life, but with the lives of those who went with him, like Paul Kipfer. Right, and the sources present this pretty neutrally. They acknowledge that viewpoints differed. Some saw him as this visionary genius, boldly advancing science and human exploration. While others saw him perhaps more critically. Yeah, as maybe a reckless gambler, someone whose risks were borderline irresponsible. It's that classic debate about the ethics of extreme exploration, isn't it? It is, but regardless of where you fall in that debate, the impact of his actual scientific contributions seems pretty undeniable. Oh, definitely. Take the data from those early stratospheric flights, for example. What about it? The sources highlight how that high altitude data collected under such extreme conditions, was genuinely crucial back then. It provided real empirical evidence that helped validate aspects of Einstein's theories. Related to relativity. Yes, and it certainly opened up new avenues for research in high-energy physics, the study of those cosmic rays he was chasing. And his influence clearly stretched far beyond his own lifetime and his own specific achievements. Absolutely. His drive, his boundary pushing, seems to have inspired a whole lineage. His son, Jacques, took over the deep sea work, broke those depth records. And then his grandson, Bertrand Picard, became this record-breaking balloonist and, more recently, a pioneer in solar-powered flight around the world. Wow. The sources sort of imply that maybe that kind of courage, that deep curiosity, isn't just learned. Maybe it can even be inherited. The Picard family history certainly makes a compelling case. When you look back at his whole life story, from the edge of space down to the bottom of the sea, there's this really powerful recurring theme that emerges, doesn't there? What stands out to you? Well, it feels like the sky and the sea, they weren't just physical barriers out there for him. They almost act like mirrors. Mirrors reflecting what? Reflecting our own potential, maybe. Yeah. And the limits we think are there, the ones we perceive. That's a great way to put it. It strongly suggests that so many of the barriers we face, whether it's in exploration or just in our own personal or professional lives, are often self-imposed. Or at least they're more permeable than we think. Right. If we're willing to actually challenge them, to push against them like he did, Picard's entire life feels like a testament to pushing past those perceived limits. And this is where his story really comes home, I think. It poses these direct questions to you, the listener. Questions drawn from the source's own reflections on his life. Like what? Like what if the next crisis you face, instead of feeling like a dead end, was actually a doorway? A doorway to a completely new solution. A chance for some kind of unexpected innovation. Exactly. And how high are you willing to reach for your own dreams, whatever they might be? 
and maybe just as importantly, how deep are you willing to dive? To pursue truth or understanding in your own work, your own life. Picard's journey is just this remarkable case study. Yes, in audacity, absolutely. But maybe even more importantly, in resilience. And that ingenuity born out of sheer necessity. And that relentless fundamental human drive just to know, to explore beyond the edges of the map, beyond what's comfortable or understood. So maybe the takeaway is when you encounter uncertainty or you hit that moment where everything feels like it's going wrong. Like mercury spilling in your tiny cabin at the edge of space. Yeah. Remember Picard's approach. Assess the situation. Don't panic. Improvise with whatever resources you actually have. And maybe most crucially, absolutely refuse to surrender to despair. Keep pushing. His life really leaves us with this compelling final thought, doesn't it? It's echoed in the source's conclusions. Which is essentially when you find yourself standing at the edge of something challenging, something unknown. Will you let fear keep you grounded? Or will you figure out a way, maybe an unconventional way, to build your own balloon and rise? Dare to explore, because maybe, just maybe, your greatest potential, like those wonders of the stratosphere and the deep ocean, awaits those who refuse to accept the limits they see. That's definitely a powerful idea to hold on to.